A Guide to Growing Radishes This root vegetable has been around since pre-Roman times. It's got a fairly distinct peppery taste and is packed with lots of great nutrients. Radishes make for a crunchy addition to salads, but are also tasty when roasted, pickled, and thrown in tacos. Radish Varieties Early Scarlet Globe This globe-shaped bright red variety has a small taproot and takes 23 days to harvest. Fuego This variety is round, red, and have medium tops. They're resistant to fusarium and tolerant to black root slash black scurf. They're harvest ready after 25 days. Plum Purple a rounded, deep magenta variety that's large in shape and can be harvested after 25 days. Snowbell, a smooth, white, and round variety that's ready for harvest after 30 days. French Breakfast, this variety has more of an oblong shape. It's red near the top with a white tip and takes 23 days to be harvest ready. Icicle, a long, white, tapered variety that takes 25 days to become harvest ready. China Rose. Rose colored on the outside, white on the inside, and takes 52 days for harvest. Chinese White. This variety is quite large and fairly long with square shoulders and blunt tips. Its roots are creamy white and it takes 60 days to become harvest ready. Round Black Spanish. This type has a distinctly rough and black skin, white flesh, and takes 55 days to harvest. Tama Hybrid. This is a daikin type of radish, taking 70 days for harvest. Its roots get as long as 18 inches with a three inch diameter. They're smooth, white, and have a blunt tip. Radishes are always grown from seed, then directly planted so as not to disturb their roots. Seeds germinate best at 55 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 13 to 24 degrees Celsius, and need about five to 10 days to emerge. As well, their soil pH should be between 6.0 and 7.0. Here's a step-by-step -step guide for starting radish seeds. Step one, prepare the garden bed by loosening the soil at least six inches deep, a foot or more for long types. For daikin varieties, create raised beds to ensure there's enough loosening of the soil. It'll also make the harvesting process much easier. Step two, radishes grow best in rich, loamy soil that's been amended with composted manure. Add one cup of a complete organic fertilizer for every 10 feet, three meters of row. Step three, allow about one inch between seeds in the row. Step four, Plant seeds from smaller varieties shallowly, about a quarter to a half inch deep. When growing a bigger variety, seeds can be sown up to one inch deep. Step five, heavy rains or excessive watering can cause soil crusting, which may weaken the seedlings emergence. If the soil surface has crusted, it should be lightly sprinkled with water to moisten and soften the crust. Step six, Thin radishes to about two inches between plants as soon as they reach a small edible size. For larger varieties, like daikins, allow four to six inches between plants. Pull any weeds from the row when thinning radishes. Note, although sunlight is needed for radish seeds to grow, it's not needed for them to germinate. Watering. Radishes are pretty low maintenance, needing little care after planting. One thing they do need though, is a consistent and sufficient supply of water. Drought stress can cause their roots to develop poor flavor and a tough texture. So if radishes don't get an inch of rain each week, soak the soil thoroughly at least once a week to keep them nice and watered. Thinning. Thin radishes shortly after the seedlings emerge. Radishes are quick growers, so they need 1.5 inches of space between them for quick root growth. Bonus, any thinned leaves or roots can be eaten in salads. Weeding. 
Weeds should be removed carefully from around the radish plants because the radishes do not compete well. Weed control is especially important during and just after germination, when radish plants are growing slowly. It's helpful to avoid deep cultivation around the plants though, since root pruning and damage will affect their growth and yield. Fertilizer. By adding nitrogen fertilizer, or nitrogen-rich organic manure, chicken coop manure, alfalfa pellets, compost tea, fish fertilizer, etc., close to the radish plants, it will help them to produce lush tops and small roots. A quarter cup of a nitrogen-based fertilizer, 21 to 0 to 0, can also be applied for each 10 foot of row. Apply it about three to four weeks after the seedlings emerge to encourage them to grow quickly. Simply place the fertilizer to the side of each plant, then water it into the soil. Mulch. Mulching with three to four inches of herbicide-free grass clippings, weed-free straw, compost, or other organic material will keep the soil's moisture while keeping weeds at bay, which means that cultivation doesn't have to happen as often. Beans, beets, lettuce, mint, parsnips, peas, spinach, squash, tomatoes, and carrots are all good companion plants for radishes. Pole beans and sweet peas, which rise high above the garden on stakes, help fix nitrogen in soil and enhance production while juicing up the soil for other high nitrogen feeders, like lettuces. Radishes are also used as trap crops because they help repel cucumber beetles. This means cucumbers are also great companion plants for radishes. Avoid planting radishes near potatoes because they don't grow well together. Raised beds. A planting bed that sits on top of the existing soil. Raised beds should at least be eight inches deep for radishes to thrive. Containers. Fast growing radishes will thrive in pots. And this is also a great option when a garden area struggles with root maggots. In these containers, radishes will need at least four inches of soil depth, plus lots of water. Containers should also have holes in the bottom for drainage. A note about cruciferous crops. Before planting radish, which is a cruciferous vegetable, consider these important factors. One, make sure that no cruciferous crops or related weed, like wild radish or wild mustard, has been present in the growing space for at least two years. Four years is best. This would include cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, kale, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, Chinese cabbage, all mustards, turnips, rutabagas, and of course, radishes. Two, as well, cruciferous plant waste should not have been dumped on these fields. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations, but if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. 
Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days for about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Cabbage Root Maggot These maggots feed on the roots of plants, creating tunnels, and can actually destroy the whole root system, which impacts a plant's nutrient uptake and support. The first signs of damage from these pests are the wilting of plants in hot weather, or the yellowing or purpling of a plant's leaves. Later on, plants will collapse and can die completely. Unfortunately, once the damage from root maggots is noticed, it's usually too late to treat the maggot problem. Here's what to do. Practice crop rotation and avoid applying animal manure or green manure during the springtime, since rotting and decaying organic matter will attract these maggots. Be sure to remove any affected plants in the fall, including their roots, and destroy them. This will kill any maggots that might be left over. Row covers are also an effective option to help prevent adult flies from getting near plants to lay their eggs. Just be sure to set up the barrier by the time adult flies are laying eggs. Keep in mind too that it's best to choose a barrier that allows both sunlight and rain to get to the plants. Because of this, floating row covers might not be the best option for large gardens. Common organic cures for root maggot include spreading diametaceous earth, a natural powder made from the skeletons of tiny aquatic creatures around seedlings, or using natural predators like spiders, ground beetles, and rove beetles to fend them off. In some cases, intercropping with clovers or legumes can also be helpful in limiting maggot infestations. Flea beetles. Small beetles that are either black, a blue color, bronze, gray, or sometimes striped. Flea beetles jump when they're disturbed, and they also shimmer in the light. Flea beetles feed on leaves and seedlings, and the damage from their feeding habits can stunt a plant's growth, reduce yields, spread diseases, or kill seedlings off entirely. Young plants are especially vulnerable while older plants can survive an infestation much better. Here's what to do. Use a lightweight floating row cover at the beginning of the season to prevent flea beetles from becoming an issue. There's also a homemade spray that uses two cups of rubbing alcohol, five cups of water, and one tablespoon of liquid soap that can work to repel these bugs. Test out this mixture on a single leaf first let it sit overnight, then spray the rest of the plant if there aren't any side effects. Dusting plants with plain talcum powder can also help, as well as using white sticky traps to capture these pests as they jump. As well, weeds attract and shelter flea beetles, so it's important to keep weed growth under control. Insecticides might help for about a week, but they'll need to be reapplied and adding a layer of mulch is yet another option. Be sure to practice crop rotation and plant seeds early to give them lots of time to establish themselves before the beetles become a problem. Mature plants are less susceptible to damage, so make sure to protect more vulnerable seedlings. Slugs and snails. These slimy pests are either hard-shelled or soft and they are nocturnal creatures who feed on the leaves and stems of a plant during the night. The feeding damage from these pests leaves irregular shaped holes behind. Leaves can also be shredded or eaten entirely, and there will also be slime trails on nearby rocks, plants, and walkways. These pests thrive in damp conditions, damage a plant's growth, and also affect a plant's ability to form roots. Here's what to do. Wet conditions encourage slugs and snails. So 
Although it's important to keep the soil moist, it's just as important not to overwater any plants. As well, avoid overhead watering and keep any organic waste away from plants. If possible, hand pick any slugs or snails at night, which is when those pests are most active. Beer traps are another way to handle a snail or slug problem. For this, dig a hole in the ground and place a large cup or bowl into the hole. It's best to use something with steep sides so that the slugs can't crawl back out when they're done, like a mason jar. Fill the jar about half full with beer and let it sit overnight. In the morning, the jar should then be full of drowned slugs that can then be flushed down the toilet. Another option is to place a barrier of diametaceous earth, a natural powder made up of the skeletons of tiny aquatic creatures around plants to keep snails and slugs away. Alternaria leaf blight. This fungus loves warm and wet conditions, causing brown spots with yellow edges to appear on the leaves, usually the oldest leaves first of a crop. The center of these lesions will also develop gray to brown soft fungal mold, eventually drying out and giving leaves a shot hole appearance. As the disease progresses, leaves will begin to curl and eventually will die and drop from the plant. This disease is common in growing areas with high temperatures and frequent rainfall. Here's what to do. Plant certified disease resistant seeds when possible and water plants from below to avoid having soil splash up onto the lower leaves of the plants. It's also helpful to water plants in the morning so that they have time to dry out during the day. In addition to watering plants from below, it's also helpful to provide a well-ventilated cover for the plants to protect the plants from rain. Be sure to clean any equipment between uses to prevent the spread of bacteria. And do not prune or handle plants when those plants are wet. As well, establish a crop rotation and stick to it. If there are any blighty leaves present, usually on the bottom of the plant closest to the soil, remove and destroy them. Finally, plant leaves can be sprayed with a baking soda solution, one tablespoon baking soda, 2.5 tablespoons of vegetable oil, and one teaspoon of liquid soap to one gallon of water, or neem oil. Just take care not to use neem oil when pollinating insects, like bees or other beneficial insects are present. Spray only a few leaves to start, then check for a reaction before applying every two weeks. Club root. This fungus lives in the soil and causes deformed roots, and those affected roots are then unable to absorb water and nutrients for the plant. Club root can actually remain in the soil for as long as 10 to 20 years under the right conditions, and this disease is typically more common in acidic soils. Unfortunately, Club root can already be well established before any symptoms are visible above the soil. Here's what to do. Once club root is present in the soil, it can survive for many years, up to 20. So it's hard to completely get rid of it from the soil. If club root is present, it can help to solarize the soil. To do so, Simply leave a clear plastic tarp on the soil surface for four to six weeks during the hottest part of the year. That tarp will trap the heat of the sun, which will help to reduce the presence of club root. As well, plant resistant varieties when possible. Keep a clean garden and rotate crops properly. For club root, a five to seven year crop rotation is best. Carefully remove any infected plants and sterilize garden tools, one part bleach to four parts water after use. It can also work to try raising the soil's pH to a more alkaline 7.2 by mixing oyster shell or dolomite lime into the soil in the fall. Make sure soil is well draining too. Try to maintain high levels of calcium and magnesium in the soil and don't move any infested soil into healthy areas. Downy mildew. 
This fungal disease thrives in cool, humid climates. At first, downy mildew causes leaves to turn yellow, typically starting from the main vein, then spreading outward. Fungal spores that are grayish, purple, fuzzy spots will then grow on the undersides of leaves. Downy mildew typically affects young, tender leaves, and severe infections can also cause curled and distorted leaves. Sometimes those affected leaves can then become dehydrated and then drop from the plant entirely. When seedlings are affected, their growth is stunted, and downy mildew can also reduce crop yields while acting as an entry point for other diseases. When older plants are affected, in addition to the lesions they get, they will also seem more rigid and narrow as compared to healthy plants. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Practice good crop rotation. Ensure good air circulation around plants and water plants early in the morning. This last tip gives the plants enough time to dry out during the day, making those plants less vulnerable to infection. Downy mildew is usually spread when leaves are wet for too long, so it also helps to avoid overhead watering. As well, be sure to keep weeds from growing. Once plants have downy mildew, the best thing to try is to eliminate moisture and humidity around the infected plants. If possible, try to improve their air circulation through selective pruning. In general, downy mildew normally clears itself up in an outdoor garden once the weather warms up, since it doesn't do well in warm temperatures. Also, if there are any infected plants, be sure to remove all crop remains after harvest to avoid reinfection, since this fungus can survive in crop residue. Keep in mind too that downy mildew is much easier to control when a plant's leaves and fruit are kept protected by a copper spray. Copper treatments can begin two weeks before the disease normally appears and when a long period of wet weather is in store. Copper treatments can also start when the disease first appears. Then those treatments can be repeated at seven to 10 day intervals for as long as the treatments are needed. Fusarium root and stem rot. This disease causes the stems of a plant to swell and become distorted at the base of the plant. Any affected areas will begin to wilt and turn brown, and eventually these areas will dry out and harden. As well, deep, dark rot will grow into the tuber and form cavities, while there's also a growth of white mold. Typically, this disease is spread by infected transplants. Here's what to do. Plant disease-free roots, or use cut transplants rather than slips. As well, practice crop rotation and treat seed roots with an appropriate fungicide before planting the roots into the garden. Keep the garden free of any plant debris, destroy any infected plants, and avoid overhead watering. It also helps to improve the air circulation around the plants. Scab. This fungus causes small water-soaked or pale green spots to appear on the leaves, and those leaves may seem ragged because of the cracking and tearing of their infected spots. On the fruits, there will be small, gray, lightly sunken, oozing spots that will only get bigger. As well, brownish-yellow lesions can grow on the roots. Oftentimes, scab is difficult to control since it stays in the soil for a long time. Here's what to do. Avoid getting the leaves of plants wet and water plants early in the day so that the plants can dry as quickly as possible. Also, avoid crowding plants by spacing the plants apart for better air circulation. Finally, be sure to remove any and all infected plants and then avoid planting in infected areas for about four years. White rust. Yellow spots will appear on the upper sides of leaves, while clusters of white, blister-like pustules, pimple-like growths, appear on their undersides. The leaves might also curl and thicken. Infected plants can collapse if the disease spreads fast enough. This particular fungal disease thrives in dry conditions, 
and is spread by the wind. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. As well, cultural control methods like crop rotation, ample spacing, and sanitation of garden tools should also be used. If the disease progresses, then a fungicide can be used to manage the spread of white rust. Radishes are a fast-growing vegetable, which means it doesn't take long for them to be ready to be enjoyed. Radishes can be harvested once their roots have reached full size, which is anywhere from 25 to 45 days since seeding, depending on the variety that's been planted. To harvest, simply pull up the plants by their tops, then trim off the leaves. Next, wash them before sticking them in plastic bags and storing in the fridge for two to four weeks. Radishes should be harvested before any frosts or freezes. With Dakin varieties, their shoulders, the top of the vegetable, will typically stand up out of the soil. To harvest Dakins, use a spade or fork underneath the crop to harvest their long roots without breaking them. When stored at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius, with high humidity, radishes will keep for four weeks or longer.